Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. If you, if you say, hey, we were in that chapter last week. You're right. And the week before. Come on, somebody. And the week before. I don't even know how long we've been on this chapter. But there's so much in Hebrews chapter 11 that you can put in your spirit and have your faith increase that I want to make sure that we squeeze it out because I, I'm teaching on a topic or I'm teaching on a series that we're calling No Substitute. Now, some things in life have a substitute. For instance, you can, you can uh, go and go to the store and you can get some sugar and you can go and bake you a cake. But in the same area, you will find something called sugar substitutes. And the problem with sugar substitutes is they almost taste like sugar. Come on, somebody. They ought to be called sugar kind of, but with an aftertaste. Come on, somebody. But some things in life have no substitute. An example of that would be this. My wife, there's no substitute for Pastor Crystal in my life. Period, end of discussion. I could talk to you for 10 hours a day and I still wanna talk to her when I get home. I could be around you all day long and I still wanna be around her because there is no substitute for who she is in my life. In the body of Christ, there are things that have no substitute, and we're on one right now. Hebrews 11 and 1 says this, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In Christianity, if you're a Christian, just lift one hand, just kind of wiggle it around like that so I know who I'm talking to. Two people, Jake, praise the Lord. <laughs> if you're a Christian, there's no substitute for faith. And faith is standing under a belief without regard for what you see. Faith says, I'm healed when the doctor's report says otherwise. Amen. Faith says, my children will serve God when you're watching them act like a goofball. Faith is a requirement to please God in the kingdom of God. In other words, believing God more than you believe anything else. That means you still believe he's going to make a way where there was no way. When they say, hey, we're going to have some layoffs, the pandemic's happening and this is going to happen. And you stand on the fact that God will supply your needs according to his riches in glory. That is faith. And faith is without works or action associated with it is dormant or dead. So for us, we want to have living, active faith. Amen. And when you have living, active faith, now you please God or you are accepted by God because to be accepted by God requires faith. And faith is something that you stand under. It is a belief that God is right no matter what I see around me. I know times are challenging, but let me just tell you, 100% certain times have been challenging, challenging since the inception of time itself. There have always been challenges. Right after Jesus rose from the dead, uh, the Romans came in and just really took over the area, and almost all the apostles you read about were murdered because of their faith. That sounds like a pretty challenging time to me. And here's how they talked about it. I counted all joy to be a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. Because they believed what Jesus says more than what they were seeing. Amen. And there's no substitute. If you, live for, if you live for God, if you're a Christian for 100 years, you're still going to have some things in your life that you don't have all the answers to. And you're going to have to live by faith. No matter how much faith it took for you to get to this point, you're still going to have to live by faith tomorrow because there's no substitute for faith in the body of Christ. There's no substitute for faith in the kingdom of God. It's a total shift when you understand, I know I'm not going to see everything. I know I'm not going to understand everything. It is, a, it is a, a, an understanding that there are some things that I can substitute things for, but faith is not something I can substitute in this kingdom. I have to go through life knowing I won't see all the answers before I believe that God is bringing the answer. So what shifts in your life when you realize there's no substitute is now you don't get wigged out every time you don't have the answer. 
You don't start shaking in your boots when you don't have the answer. On the contrary, you start to get a little bit more confident because you remember that he who began a great thing in you, come on somebody, he's going to bring it to pass. So when you go through this life, you have to understand as a believer, there is no substitute for faith. Now we've been on this topic because I'm a pretty topical teacher. I like to really make sure we get it in our spirit and then we'll move on. But right now we're in the, we're, we're, we're learning about faith and how to apply faith to our life. But I encourage you to go back and listen to the last several weeks because a lot of it's going to build some of the runway that we're jumping off of today. But I want to start now in verse number 11. The scripture says through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child. She had a baby boy when she was past age because she judged him, God, who had pro- faithful, who had promised. Verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. Abram was as good as dead, the Bible says, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Verse 13, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded, somebody say persuaded, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed. Somebody say persuaded, embraced, confessed. This is how you live by faith. You decide God's word is right. Persuaded means fully convinced. You decide God's word is correct. You decide that God has the final say. But it doesn't stop with just believing God is right. The devil believes God is right. He just doesn't embrace him. Come on, somebody. So it starts with being persuaded that God is right. But then it is an embracing of his word. Now, when you grab a hold to one thing, something had to happen first. You had to let go of something else. So you got to be convinced and then you got to hold fast your confession or your profession of faith. In other words, you have to be convinced God is right. You have to embrace the things of God. And then the next level is you got to begin to confess what God actually says about your life. You say, well, I haven't seen it yet. You're perfectly positioned to call things that are not as if they already were. What does that mean? That means the power of life and death in your tongue gives you the authority to speak life into your future and to change the environment around you with your own mouth. So you get persuaded. You embrace God's word. And then you begin to confess God's word. And you never for the rest of your life care if anybody thinks you sound too churchy. You think I care if the devil thinks I sound too churchy? You think I care if people think I sound too churchy? You know how many people have stuck a knife in my back? I don't mean that disrespectful to people. People are people. My pastor taught me how to pull the knife out, clean it up, hand it back to them, and tell them Jesus loves them. And that's what we do around here. But why would I be so concerned with what people think when they don't sit on the throne that I'll be judged by? It changes when you begin to stop having all of these boxes around your faith that some religious zealot convinced us of. Who said sounding too churchy is wrong? Who who decided that saying the name of Jesus too much is wrong? Who decided that quoting scripture All day, every day is wrong or somehow less effective. I'll tell you who decided. The the devil did in the form of a narc inside of the kingdom. Because let me tell you how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing, but not just any old thing. It comes by hearing the word of God. So every time you release, confess, every time you release the word of God, faith has an opportunity to actually be injected into somebody's life. So of course he don't want you to sound churchy. 
He'll, he'll, he'll blanket it and stuff like this. You, know, you remember how hurt you were in church. I've been hurt at Walmart. <laughs> you know why you were hurt in church? Because the church is comprised of people. Everybody always says this, politicians are crooked. Duh. <laughs> because politicians are people. And people are crooked. And you, without the blood of Jesus, would be one of the most crooked ones. Not you, the person sitting next to you. Somebody just wigged out online. They're like, but I'm alone. What? <laughs> All of us. There's nothing good in us. And any righteousness that we did compared to the blood of Jesus is filthy rags. Compared to the righteousness of our God. You don't have any hope except for Jesus, but in him we have all hope. In him, in him we live, in him we move, and we have our being in who he is, which is what sets us up differently than what we were. But you're not going to win a world by acting like the world. How will they know you're different? If you sit around the water cooler and talk just as nasty about people as they do. And don't put they in any kind of a category. I'm just talking about people you're talking to. How are they going to know you're different if when your dishwasher goes out, you lose your whole mind too? Instead of standing and believing the word of God that he's going to supply your needs according to his riches and glory. You want to you wanna confound people? You want to have people want to know what you got? When you got a flat tire, you be sitting out there singing Amazing Grace while you're changing it. What is wrong with you? God is faithful. You got a flat tire. I got three with air. <laughs> oh, you could have died on the side of the road. I'd have seen Jesus today. I'm not trying to die, but to live is should be Christ to other people through you. That's what he meant. He said, while I'm here, I'm representing Christ through you because he, is, he, he, Paul, was in Christ representing him to people. But to die is gain. Nobody dies in Christ and is penalized for it. Amen. You have the greatest victory or you experience the greatest victory that Jesus paid for when you stop breathing on this side of eternity. But it starts with being persuaded, convinced, decide. You say, well, I'm having trouble believing it. You're having trouble deciding to believe it. You can believe anything. You teach your kids that a fat man slides down a chimney and puts presents under a tree and he eats cookies and drinks half a glass of milk and they believe it. You can believe anything. You can believe anything. How many of you ever had bad news and you just refuse to believe it? You can believe anything you want. So you decide. Remember the apostle Paul, he was talking to a guy named Agrippa one time. And, it, and Agrippa said, almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. You almost convinced me, Paul. I promise you, if he wasn't convinced before he died, and I don't think he was, he regrets the almost part of that sentence. Because it starts with being persuaded, then it starts with an embracing, all right? Everybody say embrace. embrace. When, when you haven't seen your spouse or a loved one in a long time, one of the first, especially like in the pandemic season, one of the first things you want to do is embrace them. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't hug that much. My mom did, I guess. I guess my parents did, I don't remember. But, but it wasn't like mine my normal, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't my normal to hug. It's probably because I smelled terrible because I played outside all day. I don't know. But I remember when I was dating Crystal, I went to her house and her family was the opposite of that. Like they hugged everything all the time. And I was not comfortable with that. Now I was Christian. I'm talking sold out, witnessing to everybody I could. And if I couldn't witness somebody, I'd go witness to an oak tree. It was just the way it was. But I remember I would come to their house. And, and not only that, 
They said, I love you every time somebody walked in or out of the room. And I'm sitting there and I'm going in the house. I'm like, all right, they're probably going to hug me. They're probably going to tell me they love me. It's no big deal, Brian. Just say it. Just say, I love you. Just say, I'm talking to myself, you know, just say, I love you. Just hug them. So I'm getting all ready to go into the room, go into the house. I'm breathing, breathing, breathing. Okay, here we go. Brian, hey, oh, I love you so much. You know, them type of huggers, you know what I'm talking about? To grab you and then sway a little bit. And I'd be trying to give all the signals. I'd be letting go, you know, because like, so you give the little squeeze, you know what I'm talking about? And then you relax your arms and that's the signal that the hug is over. So I'd be like, maybe if I give a real quick mm, embrace and then release, maybe that'll, maybe that'll shorten this whole event. Brian, oh, come in here. We love you. Come on, we're going to eat. We've been cooking all day. Oh, and I'm like, I'm talking huggers, y'all. Finally, I told Crystal, I said, baby, I love you. She said, I love you. I said, no, I don't want to start. I'm not trying to get in that conversation right now. I need to tell you something. I'm not saying this was right. I'm just telling you how it happened. I said, baby, she said, yes, if your parents keep hugging me, I'm not coming to your house anymore. (laughs) They just love you, and I love them. I'm just not comfortable with all the hugs. Now, in hindsight, it's one of the most beautiful things that I learned is to embrace one another. But then I had children. And from the time that first baby, whoo, from the time that first baby hit the ground, all I want to do is hug them. They can't even walk by me without me just touching their arm, without me running my hand down the side of their head. And it doesn't matter if I've told them a hundred times today, I'm going to tell them I love them again. I love you. I love you. I love you. Come here. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. I'm proud of you. And that's what he means by embrace. It's not that I'm doing the word just because I have to. I love the word of God. The word of God set me free. Without the word of God, we wouldn't even know who Jesus is. The word of God is an embrace. No, 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 no. It's something that you fall in love with that pays dividends for the rest of your life and all of your eternity because one day in his house is better than thousands elsewhere. It is an embrace of what he has caused humans to scribe and impressed upon them to write down so that you and me could have the answers to everyday life and all the big problems too. It's an embrace. It's a love affair. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but if you think the Bible's boring, respectfully, you probably haven't read much of it. Because the Bible's the only book that reads you when you read it. You can, you can read a scripture a hundred times, and then in the day you need it, it says something to you that only the Bible can say. Lastly, well, first off, we're persuaded, we embrace, and then we confess. Because when you fall in love with the word, and then you begin to confess the word, then the word begins to work in other people around you. Can you imagine that? You being a tool used by God to set somebody free. And they don't have to hear Thus saith the Lord, and you prophesy their entire future most of the time. Most of the time, they just need to know what was already written about them in the love letter that is addressed to each and every one of us. Because when, the, when you begin to feel the pressures of having the exact thing to say, and, oh, i got to have the exact thing to say, then all of a sudden, that's not an easy and light yoke. That's heavy. 
And that type of government belongs on his shoulders who can actually handle them. But the one he put on your shoulders is light and easy. Let me watch. Let me show you how easy it works. I'm just not feeling good. Well, God says that he, his son, he died for you and me. And guess what? By his stripes, you're healed. And don't feel like you have to explain it indefinitely after that because the word of God works. It just has to be released. And the way it is released is out of your mouth, which is the confession that he's talking about. How long do I say it until you see it? And then you talk about it as a testimony of what God did, which helps other people as well, because we overcome with two with a two part recipe, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So you prophesy your future that you want to see. Then after it happens, you tell people about how it happened and then that helps them get free in that same area. But you got to believe it. You got to be convinced. No more pity, Pat. It's 2020. The world's on fire. No more pity, Pat. No more lukewarm Christians anymore. We're in a pandemic and our church is growing. Of course, we're limiting who all can come in and whatnot, you know, based off of capacity and all the stuff we're, we're doing and we try to do. But our church is growing. Amen. I think one of the reasons our church is growing is because a lot of times when, when hard times hit, you need the reality of the word of God and not the comfort that is a false comfort that religion can bring. Because the reality of the word of God will change your life. You just have to release it. And it's not your responsibility for the word of God to happen. It's your responsibility to confess it or to get it out of your mouth. And you're always going to have those insecure thoughts that try to stop you from releasing the word. Because the devil is not going to stop working until he's finally thrown into the lake of fire. So he's constantly going to try to convince you not to say it. And for some of you that don't quote the word around people, when you first start, it might be really uncomfortable. But once you start, not only will the people around you benefit from it, but also you'll find there is no other life. There's no other life. You can't go too far in Jesus. If you follow his word, you can't go too far in him because at the, at the, at the, pinnacle of this entire thing is love and you can't go too far with love and love is the thing that's never going to fail in your life but bitterness is easier than love hatred is easier than love a calloused heart is easier than love forgiving somebody who hurt you that never apologized is more challenging than holding a grudge because holding a grudge comes naturally to you Well, how is that? Because you're a part of the world. Well, what do you mean I'm a part of the world? Well, you're formed out of it. It's the God part on the inside of you that's trying to get out. You are earth with the breath of God in you. Dust to dust. So what happens is you decide not only to be persuaded, but you decide to embrace, to fall in love with the word. To fall in love with Jesus. To fall in love with this Holy Spirit. Oh, well, I don't know if I believe all that. Well, then go write your own Bible and start a cult. Because we're just reading out of the book. And the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Son is and just as much God as the Father is. So we don't kick him out of church because some people are uncomfortable when he moves. I have found the people who are uncomfortable when he moves are the ones he's probably moving for. Persuaded. Firmly convinced. I'm standing under the the fact that your word is true. Embraced. I don't just think it's true. I love your word and I love you. Confess. Say what you want to see. 
don't say what you see. Oh, they'll never make it. Stop prophesying their demise. Oh, I've, I've never been good at this. I've never been good at that. You should certainly be humble. You should certainly not be haughty. There's no place in the Bible where God says to talk bad about yourself when he's talking good about you. Persuaded. Embrace. And confess. And watch the world change around you. I got an uncle that's a Christian counselor and a pastor over in East Texas. One of my favorite things that he does, he says, I do this with all my clients. He said, he said the first ground we cover is, are you born again? Because if you're not born again, if you're not a member of this kingdom, then the benefits don't necessarily apply to you. He said, once they're born again, then we can work with that. But you got to be born again. And once you're born again, now you're not what you were. You're not a sinner anymore. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. You may sin, you may mess up, but the righteous fall seven times. God didn't stop calling them righteous. He actually said, you're going to fall. Bump your neighbor and say he's talking to you now. No, don't do that. But when you believe the word of God and are persuaded, when you embrace the word of God and you confess the word of God, you got to understand you can confess it to people all day long. You can say and share the word of God to people all day long. But if they're not born again, that's not the kind of soil that produces incredible harvest. So sooner or later... They're going to have to come to terms with the fact that they need to be born again. Because that's the entry point into this kingdom is the new birth. And once you are born again, once you believe on Jesus Christ, confess him as your Lord, then all of a sudden, all your old life passes away and you become a new creature, a new creation. I guess I want to say it just a little bit different. You can't work with your old life. You got to have a new one. You got to leave the old life and step into this new one. And when you do that, the book opens up to you. But if you don't, from the outside, you'll think we're all nuts. We would use the word peculiar, but you might use the word nuts. Because from the outside, faith doesn't make any sense. But when you're in him, it's like there is no other way. That doesn't mean you don't have challenging times. My God, the more challenging the time is, the more God trusts you to endure. God's playing chess, not checkers. He's positioning you in places that sometimes the move is not just one angle or another. It might have been five different moves to set you up to get one person born again that you're going to come in contact with. Because the minute you become a Christian, now all of a sudden you're an ambassador for this new kingdom. And ambassadors don't spend all their time in their home country. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching this morning. Ambassadors become ambassadors and then they get sent out to take the culture and to represent the nation that they are an ambassador of. That's what he meant when he says you're in the world, you're not of the world. So now that you're not of the world anymore, you're an ambassador representing the, representing the culture and the interests of the new kingdom that you're a part of now that you're born again. So in the course of you walking this thing out, it requires a consistency of being convinced. It requires a consistency of embracing God's word. And then the next level is for you to begin to speak God's word out of your mouth so other people can hear it. 
say, well, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. You can ask anybody that knows me personally. I don't go hanging out with everybody. I just don't do it. I don't go eat dinner with everybody. I just don't do it. I got a family and I spend a lot of time with my family. But personal evangelism is one of the greatest opportunities to see God move in your life. And it is extremely high priority for every leader in this house, including myself and my family. And when you begin to watch the word work, because maybe not every time, but a lot of times it feels like this. This isn't going to work. And then you share him. And you talk about an old rugged cross. If you don't know how to witness, you could literally just recite amazing grace and then shut up and watch the power of Jesus work. Because Jesus doesn't always have to be explained. A lot of times he just has to be released. And the power of our God in this realm is released by the ambassadors and members of the kingdom out of the power that he placed in our mouth. And when you start using that, not only does your life change, there'll be people and then people. It's the greatest pyramid pyramid scheme in all eternity. Somebody won Billy Graham to the Lord. How cool will that be in heaven? When Billy walks up with millions of people behind him and says, I just want to thank you for leading me to God. Because all these people. That's who you are. And whether you've been saved a long time or you're going to get saved this morning, there's no substitute for faith. Can you give God a hand of praise right there? Hey guys, we just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's worship experience. Here at New Heights, we're passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you experienced today, you can replay this message or any other message at www.newheightschurch.info. Three.